right, uh, I'm Preceptor Amat, uh, and I'd like to introduce our speaker this evening. Uh, Kimberly is the owner, designer, and producer of The Magicians, a uh, top solution provider for Second Life and Open Simulator. And I'm not familiar with that, so I'm going to have to start investigating the uh, magician here. Uh, but Kim will speak about the business of providing virtual world solutions to educators, including some of her past projects as example. And she'll offer tips for educators and content creators who work with them, her view of uh, future virtual worlds, and advice about planning a resilient and future-proof project. I think we could all use that last uh, tip. So right now I'll just turn the uh, presentation over to Kim, and thank you very much, Kim. Thank you for the introduction, and hello, everybody. Let's see. Let me get my script out, and I guess I should go stand near the stage, right? Let's see here. That'll work. So let me get myself situated. Is everybody ready to go? OK. So I did a little research over the weekend. And it turns out I seem to have been developing content in Second Life for educators longer than any other solution provider out there. I began doing custom builds in Second Life in 2004. And in 2005, I worked on my first education project for UC Davis's Medical Center. I created objects used to simulate real world locations that would be commandeered by the State Health Department in California in order to set up emergency medical clinics in, uh, in response to biological attack. The responders could log in from anywhere, no need to rent the real venues, and could still get to know their way around and practice deploying the clinics. In the years since then, in Second Life and Open Simulator, which is very much like Second Life, I have worked for many educational institutions, nonprofits, and government agencies, and even enterprises. But in almost every case, <laughs> Hi, Rhea and Franz. <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, anyway, in almost every case, whether it was ESL, a new language, emergency response, economics, history, outreach projects, or how to build things in Second Life, my clients have almost always been teaching something. Working with educators is very different from, say, the typical enterprise virtual world project. Enterprise clients, for the most part, hire you and you build what they want, and you run it all for them. They don't care how things work, for the most part, just that it does work. This is very different from the educators I work with, who usually want to build as much of their own content as possible. And uh, even if they don't build their own content, well, you guys are in world all the time with classes and educator groups. Educators need tools and infrastructure they can manage and use themselves. I teach my clients how to use what I build for them, and I often create administrative user interfaces for scripted systems that will make their lives easier and content that they will be able to modify and add to themselves. I often have to teach my clients about or help them with features of Second Life, like land, inventory, and group management. I don't manage these things for them forever, but instead set up their infrastructure so they can manage it themselves. In fact, I wrote a couple of books about Second Life, which I have been able to give to my clients so they can look things up in the middle of the night without Skyping me to get a griefer kicked or to replace something that accidentally got moved. I guess that kind of makes me some sort of educational facilitator myself, and I do come up with a lot of ideas about how to implement educational projects, often on clients' institutional budgets, which aren't like the $7 million budget CBS had for their Second Life project. I didn't work with them or else I'd be on the Riviera right now. <laughs> it's more of a challenge giving my clients what they need within a budget that is just a tad smaller than that. I am not an academic, and I don't know all the stuff about teaching that you know, and certainly not about all the subjects you teach. So I learn a lot during each and every project as I come to understand and meet my clients' needs. I learn a little Italian or how to operate a fire truck. I rode along with paramedics for a couple of days once. I love that part of my job where I get to learn things and work with great dedicated educators 
who are fun to work with and who come to me with amazing project ideas. It's my job to figure out how to actually make those ideas work in Second Life or Open Simulator or both or sometimes even somewhere else. I find it really meaningful to work on educational projects and I don't think I have to explain that to an audience full of teachers and students, do I? <laughs> but I have brought along a couple of things today that I am going to explain. Let me see here. I'm going to turn around. Make sure. Okay. You can go ahead and click on that box that just appeared on the stage. The one that says click me. <laughs> it will give you a folder with a pair of scripted objects in it. At a uh, recent Virtual Worlds Education Roundtable meeting, shout out to the VWER crowd out there, yay, educators expressed a wish for a tool for quantifying visitors or to confirm students went to certain parts of a build. There was a desire for something that would say, indicate a student had crossed certain checkpoints in a role play or quest. The two object system in the folder you're receiving can help you to do both of those things. I figured something educators had just been asking about would make a good example at an event where I was supposed to talk about building things for educators. Like some of the folks at that meeting, not everyone has a lot of experience with scripts or programs. That's what we call scripts. Anybody here a brand new newbie? No? Okay. Well, there will be stuff in here in case you are. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, where did I leave off? Uh, oh, so this system is designed to facilitate ease of use and easy modification in order to be a good tool for someone who might not be experienced at creating content in Second Life. I'm going to explain to you some of the design considerations that came into play as I put together this example system for you. <clears throat> So the two items that uh, the box on the stage are handing out are the example greeter and something called an example distro. And uh, here are examples up on the stage so you know what they look like. After this event, when you get yours out to try, you will find the example objects contain some heavily commented scripts, which you will be able to modify by following the instructions in the comments. The greeter, which is the big red cylinder there on the stage, is usually invisible. And there are instructions in the script for how to make it invisible when you get yours out to try it. Thing is, it could be pretty confusing if you took it out of inventory to try it and it was invisible. You might not know it was there until you ran into it and it greeted you. While I would make this invisible when deploying it as part of a build or project for a client, I would probably give the client a visible backup like this. The greeter object is also phantom, which means it uh, allows another object, including an avatar, to pass right through it. Typically, I would put this object on a region landing point or maybe in a doorway. The greeting script the object contains welcomes visitors by name in chat when they pass through the object, adds their name to a visitor list in another script, and then talks to the distro. So the distro is the other object there next to the big red cylinder on the stage, the little black thing. I call it a distro, short for distributor, because distro is shorter than inventory giver and it fits better in object name fields. <laughs> it is, however, an inventory giver, and it will offer a folder of inventory to avatars the greeter tells it about. The script in the distro is full permissions, and while it hands out example content now, if you follow the instructions in the comments in the script, you will be able to make it hand out any sort of content you like for your visitors. So, two prims. Why are the greeter and distro in separate objects? They didn't have to be. I could have built this whole thing in one prim with one script. Someone new to editing objects can be prone to mishaps. We've all done it, accidentally deleted something, changed the texture. We know that editing invisible objects can be a nuisance. And you wouldn't want to miss greeting and counting any visitors while you were making repairs. You wouldn't want to be standing there trying to fix your broken greeter right on top of your landing point. So this is an object that I would set up for a client so they never had to mess with it again. That greeter, I'd set it there and they'd never have to think about it. But 
they want to be able to change what inventory it gives out when it greets people. So the greeter talks to the distro and it does it in such a way that you can put the distro anywhere in the same region and it will still work the same. And because the distro is copyable, if someone editing it accidentally deletes the distro script or the distro itself while adding or removing content or makes some other unwanted change to the object or script and because placement doesn't matter at all, you could just delete the broken distro, get out another copy and plonk it down somewhere. Sometimes two prims are better than one. Also, different avatars can own the greeter and the distro. In fact, I first used a two-object system like this when my company was doing development work in Teen Second Life for the British Council. Even a background checked adult's avatar was at that time restricted from giving inventory to teens. So the distro had to be a separate object owned by an avatar with the teen designation and abilities. This sort of two-piece system was the solution. It's handy in other ways too. <coughs> <laughs> That's right. You worked with global kids in the teen grid, I remember. Uh, so this two-piece system is handy in other ways because you can give a copy of the distro to anyone on your team and let them load it up and set it out. I remember you, friends. You had your turkeys. <laughs> I still have one. Uh, so yes, so anybody on your team could have the distro and set it up and it would get along just fine with the greeter that you own so I could set up a client's greeter so they don't need to mess with it and they can still own and modify the distro or have anybody do it for them. So that explains why the distro is a separate object and of course has to have its script but the greeter object itself contains two scripts the greeter and one called attendance which is a visitor counter why did I use two scripts instead of one? Two reasons. One, the visitor counter script is a bit more complicated than the greeter script or the distro script. And I wanted to make an example that would be something easy to understand and edit. Second, LSL scripts or Linden scripting language scripts don't have a lot of memory for storing things. And a visitor counter stores all those visitor names for you so you can check them and get your visitor count and a list of who's been by. So it's not a bad idea to put that in a script by itself where it doesn't have to share memory. And if it does fill up because you've been, say, oh, handing out free gold bricks and experience a great flood of visitors, the greeter will still greet visitors and talk to the distro so they get their folder of whatever you wanted them to receive. Speaking of receiving, there's more free stuff. <laughs> the example systems example content is yet another greeter and visitor counter object. One that works a bit differently, though you will find it comes with a note card of instructions that will work for accessing the visitor list of either counter. Instead of greeting and counting avatars that collide with it, like the example on the stage, it scans the area around it in about a 20 meter range looking for avatars. It says a greeting and maintains a visitor list, but the the one that the one that so <laughs> let me see if I can get this correct. So the greeter system here will give you another greeter system that does not talk to a distro, but it does come with a note card that will explain how to use both visitor lists. So the reason I focused on teaching you about the big red cylinder on the stage instead of something that scans is because the sensor function of LSL that does the scanning is expensive in terms of region uh, resources compared to something you just collide with and then it does its thing. Uh, you don't want something active all the time when it doesn't need to be. Scanning also gets a little flaky if there are too many avatars around. Oh, if you're looking at the examples up there, they don't have scripts in them. I clean them out. <laughs> so that they wouldn't be acting up while I was on stage. Uh, there are ways to script around the challenge of scanning getting flaky if there are too many avatars near there. Uh, but that's a tad more complicated, so I didn't get into that for your example today along with other ways to get information and give content, there are also other ways to store data. 
like a visitor list, both in Second Life or on a server. And with a little modification of the code, a system like this could IM you data in real time, telling you who just showed up at your place, or it could email it, or you could even have it do only one or the other, depending on if you're offline or online. I have a system that I use that lets me know if someone is snooping around near my Sky platform when I'm working on my very important top secret stuff, but which doesn't send messages when I'm offline so that I don't have mail coming in and waking me up. <clears throat> Another example of what can be done with a bit more work. My company developed a visitor counting and greeting system for global kids way back when, I think 2005 or so maybe 2006, and another fancier one later on when they had a lot more traffic and the old system that could store a thousand avatar names wasn't enough. They didn't want to miss avatars that didn't arrive via the main landing point. And especially because this was in, in the teen grid, it was also important to make sure everyone had a chance to see the privacy policy on the way in. We had to reach out to every avatar that teleported in right away. So my team came up with a sneaky way of checking all of the region, even up at altitude, to find and greet avatars, even if they were hiding in a cave. That's right. That was for the MacArthur, their first visitor counter. We did a second one later. So uh, anyway, uh, even if they were hiding in the cave, which we did build into their volcano for their original project, uh, this system could find them. Anyway, that system would send the visitor data to a database outside Second Life on a server that belonged to my client so they could manage it themselves and own their own data. Yes, certainly are. Now, Global Kids wanted to be able to track various areas at different times across multiple regions and they wanted to be able to add regions and track visits to different parcels and, region, and other regions both independently and aggregated. They wanted to track repeat visits too. You can see why the privacy policy was important. They also wanted to be able to change their build and terraforming without calling us in to make adjustments to the visitor system. <laughs> I automatically go to type ha ha in chat. I am such an old bee. Anyway, uh <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know somebody else went on to do a, a web interface for the, for the database. We didn't do that part for the client. They said they'd handle that themselves later. Uh, but what we did was we made an interface in World that allowed them to easily mark out and outline separate areas or regions to keep an eye on and to change them easily at any time. And Global Kids thought it was pretty nifty, and I liked it. I used it for a long time myself at my own islands. Anyway, that's memory lane for you. <laughs> the point is, you can do a heck of a lot with Second Life, and visitor counters like the example here today are just the start. Now, along with a way to count visitors, one of the things folks at the VWER meeting wanted was a way to know if certain avatars hit checkpoints while doing exercises or quests. The example greeter that you now have will tell you which avatars were there. And you could either edit the greeter text to have it give you a clue, or even have the distro give a clue on a note card in the form of a treasure map on a texture, or even some sort of object. You can do a lot with a simple gadget like this, and I hope you enjoy it and find it useful. If anybody does decide to use it instead of take a look at the scripts, and you have trouble setting it up, I am me. I'll be happy to lend you a hand. Oh, yes, the light bulb. I still have that around. Uh, let's see. Let me put these away. Did they really go away like I intended them to? Yes, they did. What good little objects they are. Okay, let's see here. <clears throat> so, one of the things I was asked to talk about today uh, is the future of virtual worlds. There sure have been a lot of changes since I came to Second Life in 2004. So, what does the future hold, and how can we prepare? Let's find out. I'm going to get over here and 
I'd like to ask everybody to say in chat your favorite magic word. Just type it out there. Mine is All right. I, I think I think it's working. All right. Good job. Good job. Oh, there it goes. This is my crystal ball, which I created for a Linden Lab event called SL Pro a few years back. It is designed to show us visions of the future. <laughs> Let me see here. Where am I on my script? Okay, good. Uh, this crystal ball was pretty accurate at SL Pro. Let's see what it shows us now. Oh, crystal ball, tell us. Tell us about the future of virtual worlds. What is going to happen? Huh. No. <laughs> Future is hazy. Try later. What the heck? <laughs> but I understand what the ball is saying. What will happen with Linden Lab's new platform? Will OpenSim stay like Second Life or grow and change into something new? How about the Oculus Rift? What about Philip Rosedale's new platform, High Fidelity, and all of the other platforms that are being developed quietly in some glass tower in Silicon Valley or maybe in someone's garage? Hard to be sure what will happen next. Have a look around you. Where are we today? Thanks a lot, Crystal Ball. I think that's not quite specific enough. <laughs> it is accurate, however. Okay, we are in Second Life. Why SL? Why not somewhere else? On the Unity platform, you can have beautiful all-mesh builds, but they are not part of a wider world. And few educators have the ability to create their own content for it. Custom mesh development will probably cost you a fair bit more than a prim build. For some projects, though, it is a good choice. If you're interested in Unity, hmm. OK, talk to Gabriel then. Gabriel's actually working on a cool project with Unity, which I need to learn more about tonight. Let's see. Open Simulator is a better fit for a lot of educational projects and has come a long, long way. My company has used it successfully for a particularly motivated client that has continued to add to it ever since. And they even arranged to allow other educational institutions to use it, though I'm pretty sure they'll charge you if you do. <clears throat> you could even buy that simulation from my company. I call it Main Street, and it's for business students. Because of features Second Life doesn't have, you can copy an entire region from Open Simulator in one file and then just hand it to someone or sell it to them. It's much easier to share. OpenSim is great for a lot of educational projects, especially, very good, I was going to plug it, but you beat me to it. Uh, so uh, it's great for a lot of educational projects, especially with younger students or if you have other reasons to keep your entire project behind 8-Ball. Oh, hi, 8-Bit. Uh, if you want to know about OpenSim just in general, you can probably talk to Ree there or Mr. C Steven Zootfly in the audience. He operates an OpenSim grid for Ball State, and he's also one of the organizers of the Open Simulator Conference. But we aren't in Open Simulator right now either. We're in Second Life. Why? Second Life costs more than Open Sim. Backups are not as easy as they are in Open Sim. But for those who can afford it and don't need to be in a closed grid, 
That's it. Second Life is still the place to be. Second Life gets a lot more press than Open Sim, and people have heard of it. And community, stability, content, support, and the fact that we already have Second Life accounts and nice looking avatars count for a lot. That's right. Good to see some Open Sim evangelists out here because there are so many good uses for Open Sim and so many people just don't know about it. Ah, oh, so that's me on a good day. <laughs> Uh, avatar appearance might seem like a frivolous thing at first, but the ability to customize your avatar easily with readily available content in countless stores and the marketplace really does facilitate identification with and comfort using an avatar. Academic studies show that avatar appearance has real ramifications for student performance and for teachers too. What other virtual world allows you so many pre-made options for avatar customization as the sort of thing you can get in Second Life for free, let alone for a buck or two? You do get that, right? Buck, dear avatar, and the crystal ball. It was really funny when I wrote it at 3 a.m., sorry. Uh, let's see. Plus, <laughs> I know, I know. Don't forget about all of the educator tools readily available in Second Life. Those should look familiar. <laughs> no, wait. What is it, Crystal Ball? Waffles. My own Crystal Ball has just accused me of waffling. Okay, Crystal Ball. I get the point. I'll get down to it. We don't know yet all of the capabilities of high fidelity or whatever the lab will call their next generation world. There could be all sorts of amazing new bells and whistles and, of course, Oculus Rift. Yeah, just like that. My avatar looks like her head's been eaten by the Oculus Rift. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, thank God I do not have fur, at least right now. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's quiet down the crystal ball for a minute, and I'm going to be a little more serious. I've been in online community management for a long, long time. <laughs> waffles. <laughs> so here's what I think it really comes down to. Virtual worlds, like Second Life, are really online communities, uh, except for, you know, standalone open simulator installations, but that's something else altogether. Pretty much all of the behaviors we see in Second Life are nothing new. I and many of the people I know in Second Life came here from another world, there.com, Habo Hotel, Uru, The Sims Online. I have watched communities wane and wax from the viewpoint of a community manager. It isn't the technical bells and whistles that fill up a big rich world like Second Life with avatars and user created content. Here's what it is. People stay to be with their friends and with their content in their comfortable routine. That's a picture of myself and a good friend of mine back in around 2004. <laughs> she got so good at interior design in Second Life that she left Second Life and now does that in real life. And this is where she learned. But usually, people will stay in a virtual world with their friends, even when there are horrible technical problems, people will put up with them, they'll work around them, they'll build solutions. Unless a world closes or is pretty unusable for a long time, users will hang in there. So why do they ever leave then? Maybe their friends have all gone somewhere else and they finally leave their stuff behind and follow. 
but why does the first friend go leading the others? Policy changes, upsetting announcements, and often a general loss of trust in and love for the people behind the platform. That's really why people begin to go. Dissatisfaction and anger. Just like the first colonists who say farewell to everyone and everything they knew and head off to start anew in any land, you do get a few wild adventurers and others taking a risk in a search of a way to make money, but you get the disillusioned, the outcast, those that can't do their thing because of the rules where they came from, those that are adrift, and criminals in exile. Like, let's say, oh, banned griefers. Now, that's a scary griefer there. <laughs> Uh, in fact, when I was new to Second Life, I remember when people were other people were leaving there after me, and the griefers were some of the first ones to turn up here. It was hysterical. But basically, the community doesn't typically move on until they're upset about the old platform, and there's something just a little better to jump to. This poses a real challenge for Linden Lab. If users are mad at the lab that made Second Life, they aren't going to go to a new world from the same company. They will have to get users to go from one world to another with some other motivation. How well they succeed depends on how well things bounce back with the recent terms of service and other policy changes made by the new CEO, who I like a lot. That's true. Uh, it also will depend on how easy the lab is able to make the transition between Second Life and their new platform, and how much content can go along. It's going to be an interesting ride, and there's just not enough information yet publicly to know what's going to happen. Of course, they'll want and need to attract new users, but those are harder to hook, and there's a core of older users who are the sort of spenders, content creators, and pillars of the community that you really need to get started. High Fidelity has a similar challenge. Because Philip Rosedale was once Governor Linden, so many old B Second Life residents will make up their minds based on how they feel about him. And that's hard to call. Some of us still like Philip, others feel like he, you know, should have stuck around and I don't know done something. So it's really hard to call what's going to happen. You know, the thing is, I could speculate like this all day. And the crystal ball was right in the first place yet again. <laughs> we really can't tell what's going to happen next. There's just too many variables. Fortunately, there are some things you can do in order to prepare for the future. We aren't sure where we're going to be in a few years. That means it is smart to design your project <clears throat> so that uh, as much of it as possible will be portable. That's right, 8-bit. Custom content can probably be exported, but not things you buy from a shop. You can use an alternate viewer, like Firestorm, to export an object from Second Life if you build it yourself entirely from assets created or uploaded by you, every texture and prim. If someone built your content for you, and you have full permissions on the object, you can purchase a clone system and automatically recreate the model with you as owner, and then export it. But you have to make sure you have a signed agreement about what rights you have purchased. A note card from an avatar will not be good enough if there are questions later. There's one prominent nonprofit in Second Life that is in a bit of a bind right now because they're setting up a presence on OpenSim. Most of their Second Life content was donated, and they don't have appropriate legal agreements for many of the donated objects. You can avoid that trap. Also, if you export content, you can even export it as mesh and take it to Unity. But if you export your content, you will need to manually reassemble any complex objects. 
So <clears throat> remember our example distro that was up on the stage there that you now have a copy of? That's an object that contains another object it gives you, the other greeter example, which contains more scripts and other content. When you export an object, you will have to take the nested content out and copy each part, import it to say open sim and then reassemble. I've done a lot of this. A lot. It's easier than building from scratch, but you don't want to get into this if you are not an experienced builder. One thing to consider is if you have someone develop custom content for you, include something in your agreement. No. I'll there was a thing to click to get stuff, Beth, and I'll, here, just a sec. It's up there on the stage. You can click that and it will give you stuff. The thing that says click me. Okay, cool. I'll leave it there for now. <clears throat> so, anyway, so when you have these nested objects where they have content inside of content, you have to take them apart and reassemble them when you get them where you're going. And it is a lot of work, and it's not something you want to do if you're not a builder. But if you contract with somebody to build your content for you, or somebody volunteers to do it, you can see about including an external backup in your agreement. You might be able to arrange to have any scripted systems coded in such a way that they can run in Open Simulator if you ever decide to leave Second Life, where the scripting language is slightly different. You might be able to arrange to have Open Sim versions of your scripts included in your project, or you could even code your system in such a way that it works in both Second Life and Open Simulator, like my Main Street simulation. Stick with core features when designing a project and don't base all of your plans on a new or not yet released feature. You never know if it will be delayed or work the way you will expect. If you seriously think you might want to move on sometime, don't rely on features that you can't also get on your target platform. Like, have a, If you have a backup plan, keep it in mind as you c develop your content. Complex scripted systems are harder to move between platforms than more of an object-based build. Buildings and costumes for roleplay are easier to move or replace than something with a lot of scripts in it. Future-proofing your build means more than planning for a potential move to another world someday. There are all sorts of things that can happen to a build in Second Life and things you can do to defend against them. Do not rely on a content creator who is not an avatar owned by you or your university or whatever sort of organization you're at to maintain your backups for you. I mean, what if a monster eats them? <laughs> Things happen. Consider setting up a staff avatar that manages your content. I once had a client who brought me in to manage a project that was in progress. It involved a complex scripted system which was being developed by one person. It involved scripts that communicated with a server external to Second Life. Turns out, the server was actually in the scripter's basement, and no one else had access to it, not so much as a login. I mean, <laughs> my avatar, when I heard this, the crystal ball will show you. <laughs> That's about how I looked when I heard. Don't get yourself into a situation like that, even for a little while. You don't want to come to depend on a system over which you don't have control. Future-proofing also includes keeping your build from being accidentally destroyed. One thing you can do is, if you look on the object editor, there's a little box you can check to lock an object, and you can do that for important parts of your build, and that way, if you're building in your skybox, you will not be able to accidentally delete the floor, like I did. Also, yeah, we've done it. We've done it over and over. I still do it. If I do not keep it locked, I will delete the floor. 
Also, you or someone needs to set the correct permissions on your objects and scripts and group so things will not be taken or edited or damaged by unauthorized people or by accident. This even applies to land permissions for terraforming. Uh, who else was around here when the Camp Darfur project was wiped from the grid? <laughs> a griefer. Uh, I, yeah, I remember you guys were around then. Uh, this was way back when. Uh, a griefer exploited incorrect terraforming permissions and raised the land high enough to bury the build, which forced the objects to return. Now, the lab was able to roll back the region and things turned out okay, but that isn't always the case. If you are unsure about permission settings, it's worth getting somebody to help you. Now, you all have backups of your builds, right? I mean, every part of everything. You should have a build, a backup in inventory just in case. Oh, I know you do. <laughs> uh, you need to keep those backups in a safe place. And uh, now, let's see, I lost my place. hate it when I do that. Uh, some things are hard to load into a reser, like a res foo, to automatically replace a build. But there are other things you can do, especially for the most important parts of your build that need to be in specific places. You can label parts of your build with object names that make sense. And while you have them in world, in their correct places, check using the object editor for their location coordinates. You can write those in the object description if you have permissions to do it or on a note card. Then you know where to put things back. Exactly. You can also select and pick up several items at once and the coalesced object will appear in your inventory under the name of the last object you selected, which is, this one's kind of rough to see here. But there is a coalesced object there. Basically, all of my props for this event here today were one coalesced object. Picked them up at home, where I had a mock-up of the event space, brought them over here, and dropped them on the ground, and I was ready to go. <clears throat> you could even get the coordinates of that coalesced object and be able to replace anything at once. Just be sure you're in edit mode when you take your stuff from inventory. That is a feature. That's right, 8-bit. We can't do that in Second Life. Uh, now, by, by picking up coalesced objects and writing locations in descriptions, I've been able to recreate entire regions. It works. It's more work than exporting things in one neat file in OpenSim, but you can do it. Uh, let's see. It's important. Another aspect of planning for the future is allowing room for project expansion. Even if you don't have room left on the ground, you can always build in the sky. But any piece of land has a prim limit, a limit on how much content you can put on it. When I design a region's infrastructure for a client, I try to use no more than half of their prim allowance at most, because there is something else they're going to want to do later or build, or they're going to want to res some huge primmy thing someday. Beyond that, every object, every texture, every script adds to the load on your region. If your region is stuffed to the brim, visitors will complain about lag. Better to have fewer objects and simpler textures and a region that runs fast. And that's why I have simple objects with me today. because. If things are going to fail, they're going to fail at an event where there, where there are a lot of avatars. <laughs> Let's see. Another piece of advice. Comment your code. If you write or modify a script, be sure to put some reminders in there, at least about variables you might want to change or anything that was especially hard to figure out in the first place. Maybe someone else at your school or organization is going to have to modify that script later, and they need to be able to understand what you did there. But beyond that, way back in around 2008, my company developed a project for the University of Queensland's Religious Studies Department. Along with all sorts of houses of worship, 
for role playing and studying various religious services and other infrastructure, I put together a simple greeter system for them. That was a few years ago when I built them a greeter, <laughs> about four years ago. But because I commented my code, I was able to recall what was what and quickly modify it to build the system I gave to you today with still more comments.